friends, I am Dr. Serena Gilvas and we are the team from Jubilee Mission Medical College, Thrissur, Kerala. My PGs who are doing the final year in MS are Dr. Gopika, Dr. Aktulia and Dr. Henna. They will take you through this entire discussion on primary amenorrhea. Now I just wanted to tell you that before we start this topic, it is important that you all understand what is normal puberty and what are the changes which should occur and which does not occur in a normal girl. Okay. So, to take you through the initial stages of puberty is Dr. Henna. Henna, how do you define what is normal puberty and what are the normal pubertal changes? What is the maturation of the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis? First, we will be discussing the development of HPO axis in utero at birth and then the consequent uh, pubertal changes. So, in utero, uh, as we all know, at 11 weeks, GnRH neurons okay. migrate into arcuate nucleus of hypothalamus and extend into median eminence. There, there is a pulsatile GnRH secretion which increases FSH and LH levels and thereby the ovarian sex steroid hormones. Uh, consequent changes, there is accelerated growth and there are 6 to 7 million oocytes at 20 weeks, almost 5 months of gestation in a baby. Uh, then, at late gestation, uh, there is again sex steroid uh, that is the, the negative feedback inhibition comes to play. Later on at birth we have 1 to 2 million oocytes and there is at birth there is fallen placental estrogen levels and this causes abrupt rise in FSH and LH levels and in the neonatal period and coming to the childhood it takes 1 to 2 years. Gonadotrophin levels reach prepubertal level by 1 to 2 years and at childhood years there are low plasmid uh, levels of FSH, LH and estradiol. Estradiol is less than 10 picograms per ml and L is less than 0.1 milli international units per ml. And at puberty, as you all know, there is only 3 lakh oocytes remaining. Coming to pubertal changes, yeah. pubert so, just to summarize what uh, Dr. Henna has said, you must remember that the development of the hypothalamus pituitary axis begins in utero when the baby is small inside her mother's womb. Okay as early as mid-pregnancy. When to start with, how many million oocytes are there here now? 6 to 7 million oocytes. 6 to 7 million. But at birth, what happens? They undergo apoptosis, apoptosis. or physiological cell death. And at birth, they are about? 1 to 2 million 1 oocytes. to 2 million. It's like uh, being born with the uh, victory sign of just 2 million oocytes. And then what happens to this axis is, the GnRH goes to sleep. It goes to sleep and it awakens at the time of puberty. And at that time, the oocytes, which were 2 million at birth, has been reduced to 3 lakhs. Okay. And even in this 3 lakhs, throughout the entire reproductive years of a woman's life, till she attains menopause, it's only about 400 to 450 follicles which develop. All the other, others undergo atresia. Okay. So, it's important for you to remember that there are a lot of changes occurring from in utero to adulthood. So, um, Henna, after this, what happens? Then comes puberty. Puberty marks a normal physiological transition from childhood to sexual and reproductive maturity. This manifests as growth and pubertal changes as secondary sexual characters. So, initially, pubertal changes starts around 8 to 13 years and initially it manifests as growth spurts which occurs around 9 years. Then comes breast budding which is also known as telake which occurs around 10 years of age followed by adrenarche or pubarche that is the growth of pubic hair. But in 20% of cases, pubaki may precede tilake. And this is followed by another growth spurt which occurs around 10.5 to 13.5 years. And it culminates in menarche that which should occur by 10 to 16 years. So, puberty starts around 8 to 13 years and the entire process occurs over 4.5 years. Yeah. So, I just wanted to say that the first and most important change in the pubertal girl is actually the growth spurt. And you must remember that growth spurt will end almost at the time of menarche because it is said that once menarche occurs, epiphyseal closure occurs. And it is said that a girl will not grow more than 6 centimeters after menarche. So, once she has her first periods, you will realize that she has not much more to grow height wise. Okay. Now, why is it called tilake? What is tilake? Tilake is the changes solely seen in the breast. breast. There is a series of changes and Tanner has staged uh, these changes into different stages that is five stages as we also can uh, see in the diagram stage one is there is no palpable breast tissue areol is less than two centimeters and nipples are inverted flat and raised in other words when you look at tanner stage one there is no breast tissue it's it's just like 
the bone, muscle and skin. There is no tissue. If you are to draw the profile of the girl, there is no breast tissue. And you will find only the nipples. nipples. Only the nipple. Do you understand? That nipple could be inverted, everted or it could be flat. Then the second stage. Stage 2 is breast budding with small uh, amount of uh, breast, tissue breast tissue. And areola begins to enlarge. Correct. So, in the second stage, the, so when you see little breast tissue, it is already stage 2, okay, 3. Stage 3 is further growth and elevation of the breast. Uh, the nipple becomes at the level, at or above the level, mid plane of the breast. That is important. You find that the areola and the nipple, if you have to draw a line, it will be above the plane of the breasts, okay, that is stage 3. Stage 4? Stage 4, there is a secondary mound of breast tissue, that is breast tissue enlarges. And the uh, areola and papilla is projected as a secondary mount. And uh, stage, stage 4, so that means over the breast tissue, the areola will form one mount. And over that, another mount is actually the nipple. So, you will find three, three more, one over the other. Do you understand? That is stage 4. And stage 5? Stage 5 is mature adult breast with smooth contours and proportion. And the, the, the nipple becomes below the level at the mid plane of the breast. That is important. That is an adult breast when the plane of the nipple is actually below the horizontal. So, when it was above the horizontal, it was 3. When you had a secondary mound, it was 4. And when it is fallen below the horizontal plane, the nipple and the areola, that we call as adult breasts. Okay, that's very important. And let me tell you one more thing. Whenever you look at the breast, the most important structure that you look at is a nipple. If there is a good nipple, that means she's got good estrogen, good estrogen. It is a nipple more than anything else. It is never the breast size. Breast size could be made out of fat. It is not the glandular tissue mainly. But when you see a good nipple, you are sure that she's got good estrogen in her. Okay? Yes. Then a tanner has also staged the changes of pubic hair into five stages. Can I just stop you? What is this called? This is called pubarche. Why or is adrenache? it called pubarche or adrenarche? Because it is due to the androgens. Of the adrenals. 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 See, you must always remember one thing, the androgens of the adrenals are under the effect of ACTH, okay. And another organ which secretes androgens is the, is the ovaries and that is under the effect of LH. Mm -hmm. So, it's very important for you to know that this pubarche, which we call also called adrenarche is because the, the growth of the pubic hair and the axillary hair is under the effect of the adrenal secreted androgens, okay, yes. And uh, again, these uh, tanner stages of pubic hair is, uh, includes five stages. First stage is uh, downy hair, which is uh, it's a pre-pubertal stage. Stage two is coarse, long, crinkly hair uh, seen only along the labia majora. Stage three, we can see this coarse, curly hair, which extends up to the mons pubis. And stage four, it is seen in the mons pubis itself, but the hair becomes dense, coarse and adult type of hair. And stage 5 is when it extends onto the inner thigh. Okay, fine. Then coming to the normal menstrual cycle. One minute. How come you didn't tell us anything about the axillary hair? Axillary hair uh, is uh, dependent is no on tanners. No tanner staging. No tanner. Tanner staging is there only for breast and pubic hair. But axillary hair, we call it as mild, moderate and normal. Mm. Okay, that's all that we give. We do not have a tanner staging. But please remember that as it becomes adult hair, you will find that there is sweating and there is a pe peculiar odor. That is evidence of adult axillary hair. When you start using a DO, etc., that is adult axillary hair. Okay. And then what happens? So, what is the normal stage? First, you find thilake, then you find adrenarche pu or pubarche, and then you find the axillary hair. So, basically, normal, the first evidence of uh, development is seen in the breast. So, when you see a girl who starts developing breast tissue, then you know that she is growing. Okay, because we do not get to see a pubic hair which occurs next and then only the axillary hair. And then after that you have got another growth, growth spurt. spurt and then only you have got uh, menarche which is menarche. the first period. Yes. And coming to normal menstrual cycle, there are different factors involving the normal menstrual cycle. Environmental factors influence seen as inputs and that stimulates uh, hypothalamus into pulsatile GnRH secretion. This results in uh, release of FSH and LH from the anterior pituitary. This stimulates the ovaries to produce estrogen, androgen and the progesterone. Estrogen, uh, FSH uh, again creates a mature follicle and uh, estrogen secreted by the mature follicle stimulates LH and LH peak cause, as we all know, cause ovulation. 
and ovulation results in corpus luteum which in absence of pregnancy regress then the progesterone withdrawal results in menses yeah so as senna told us initial years are actually anovulatory so that is why the most of the time they are painless the cycles may be regular it doesn't matter but it is important for us to know this chronological order do you know why supposing a girl comes to me at the age of 15 and she tells me that i have not attained menarche okay but when i look at her she has got some breast development she has got also a little pubic hair so do you know what i tell her you go and come back after a year and maybe all the time i prescribe would be just a little iron tablet or something do you understand she goes back and then after one year she comes back and tells me uh, madam even now i have not attained so then i realize she is 16 years old but when i look at her now the tanner stage 2 of the breast has become 4 and the pubic hair tanner stage 2 which was there earlier has become 4 almost 5 so now i realize that she is growing so i tell her it doesn't matter you take my tablets for another 6 months to 1 year and by then you will attain menarche but do you think it's because of my tablets no i was waiting for the normal maturation of the hypothalamus of pituitary ovarian axis because i knew that this is tanner staging of the breast and first to develop is the breast and then the pubic hair and then the axillary hair and only then we should go for menarche so by about one and a half years after her first visit to me she has already attained menarche do you understand that is the importance of knowing that uh, the stages of development are like this okay so now she told you what exactly the normal menstrual cycle is now when would you start investigating a girl for primary amenorrhea primary amenorrhea uh, we have already you uh, know uh, seen the timeline of the uh, events normal events yes. so when a girl comes to you uh, at uh, th- 13 years of age without secondary sexual characters or at 15 years of age with secondary sexual characters we evaluate for her because uh, at 13 age uh, if there is a secondary sexual characters according to the timeline she is bound to have menarche in another 2 years or so mm-hmm. so by uh, 15 years if she does not have menses despite secondary sexual characters we evaluate then her as well and in case uh, we uh, find uh, there is worrisome features such as uh, virilizing puberty or features like blind in vagina then we don't wait for any of these we evaluate her directly yeah so that's very good to know that without secondary sexual characteristics we can investigate them even earlier because we obviously see there is a problem okay but when the going is good you can wait like how i waited You understand? Yes. Coming to the causes of amenorrhea, uh, it's broadly divided into four compartments. There is compartment one is uterus and outflow tract anomalies, which includes imperforate hymen, transverse vaginal septum, cervical vaginal agenesis, Mullerian agenesis or anomalies, and androgen insensitivity syndrome. Can I just stop you? Yes, ma'am. So compartment one is actually the outflow tract and the uterus. The uterus is also included. So we have just taken in a very practical way what all we commonly see. and that we have included in the uh, compartment 1 okay as she rightly said the commonest thing outflow tract obstruction would be um, that is uh, imperfect hymen imperfect hymen with this is commonly what we see so in that order and what is compartment 2 henna compartment 2 is ovarian dysfunction yeah. that is commonly seen as uh, ovarian dysgenesis in form of turner syndrome or swyer syndrome or pure gonadal dysgenesis and fragile x uh, syndromes And so in other words ovarian over cause. causes ovarian causes compartment 2 compartment 3 compartment 3 is anterior pituitary causes dysfunction and compartment 4 is hypothalamic uh, dysfunction and these are almost associated with together mm-hmm. so that would include pituitary adenomas craniopharyngiomas and other causes of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism okay fine so you realize that when it's hypothalamic pituitary she said rightly the levels of fsh and lh are low when it is a level 2 when it's within the ovaries you will find it is hypergonadotropic because you'll find that there is an endogen uh, failure here the ovaries have failed and so you'll find the fsh and lh are high okay right now can i ask atulya atulya we commonly see this condition of outflow ob- ob- tract obstruction so what is it which you have seen in your practice can you give us some guidelines mm-hmm. basically the outflow tract uh, conditions are uh, imperfect hymen transverse vaginal septum a vaginal cervical atresia and imperfect hymen uh, is mainly if they present in the uh, pubertal phase with urinary retention or mass in the lower abdomen they sometimes complain of cyclical abdominal or pelvic pain and in the exam we can see a bluish bulge uh, of membrane uh, through the uh, local examination and treatment is giving her a cruciate incision over the area of maximum bulge and draining the uh, uh, menstrual blood that is accumulated in she, she was very fast to incise okay but uh, what are the normal features of a person who comes with outflow tract with an imperfect hymen from uh, where is the hymen developed from uh, 
hymen is normally developed as an invagination from the posterior wall of the urogenital sinus. sinus. Okay. And this hymen normally ruptures postnatally. Nobody knows how, but it normally ruptures postnatally. Okay. So now she was talking about an imperforate hymen. So the commonest symptom the patient would have would be Cyclic cyclically. Amenorrhea. Uh, she present primary amenorrhea, cyclical abdominal pain. Primary oh. amenorrhea, she was very quick to correct me. Primary amenorrhea with cyclical abdominal, that's very important. And what is it, mass which you said? Uh, this will be the hematocorpus. It is a hematocorpus. See what Henna told us about the mass, please remember, however, it always collects only in the vagina. It doesn't go for a hematometra. So even if the level of the mass is at the level of the umbilicus, Actually, it is still a distended vagina. So, you know, you know the distensibility of the vagina. So, when you see a mass, it is bulging and as she said, the bluish discoloration. Why is it blue? Because the blood that is collected. Is because the hymen is thin. thin. It is thinned out and so you can see the color of the um, blood, blood inside, inside and that is a bluish discoloration. If I had a doubt, what could I do? Any other clinical examination? Valsalva. Uh, Very good. I can do a Valsalva and then I will see that this... Actually, in response bulge. to it, the bulge is very prominent or else I can even do a PR and I'll find that the bulge start from the outlet. You understand? That is a very important thing. Then you also told me, is there any other symptom this patient with? Uh, she can present with acute urinary retention. Very good. Many times in the casualty, when you see a young girl with primary amenorrhea comes with acute urinary retention, remember it could be a hematocorpus. So, these are the commonest presentations of a person with uh, and then um, as she rightly said, we do not wait long. Uh, but supposing I had a doubt, what would be my doubt? Into an, uh, if it is a transesogenic Yeah. Symptom. But why is it important for me to distinguish this? Because uh, we don't do any surgical intervention for a transverse vaginosis. You don't do? Like unless it is really symptom. No, no, it's not no, that. No, we do. Yes, uh, yes. The transvaginal septum is thicker and thicker. Uh, it is uh, imperforate hymen. The management is more simple. That simple. is just a cruciate exactly. incision. But uh, uh, transverse yeah. vaginal septum would require uh, excision followed by uh, establishing the connection between the upper and lower, lower vagina. vagina. That is very important. You understand? It's a little more complicated than the, uh, the hy imperforate hymen. So, because it at what level is it in normally? In, uh, usually the upper one third. It is at a higher level normally in the upper one third. So, if I have got a dot many times, I will not know what it is. I may not know what it is. So then what is the other investigation I could do? MRI. Uh, MRI. Could do MRI. Because when I do an MRI, I will know at what level the obstruction is. Is there any collection above that? How the cervix is, how the uterus is. So when you are in doubt, yes, you must. Because when you do, see how quickly Hena, I mean, uh, Atulia did the cruciate incision. If you are very sure, yes, go ahead and do what she has done. Okay, but when you do the cruciate incision for the imperfect time in Atulia, is there any nose? We should not do a, a PV, we should not give a suprapubic pressure and uh, no, suction. No, no suction also. See, the reason being? Because uh, this is collected blood and this can cause uh, infection. infection. Please remember, it is a hot night is for infection. Do you understand? So, if you do any pervaginal examination or if you put a suction or you know, if you give a suprapubic pressure, when you withdraw that pressure, it sucks the air from outside. So, it can get infected and what was your hematocolpose might become a pyocolpose. Do you understand? So, please and that can ascend up further and even cause a uh, pyometra. So, please be very, very careful. You are not supposed to introduce infection. It should be done under all aseptic conditions. Is there any other tip you would like to give me, Atulia, when I do, I am mean, doing that cruciate incision? Uh, on the maximum bulge is where we have... Very good, incision. very good. And she can said extend it posteriorly. You put the incision and then mm -hmm. you can snip off the, the tip edges, of the... So it edges. Edges. Otherwise, it doesn't close back. We once had a person... Twice, thrice they had the incision outside and they came back with a recurrent hematocorpus. So, in order to keep that opening open, either you can cut off the tip or you can evert the edges a little and keep and then put one single stitch over that. So, that it remains open and continues to be open. And the normal post-operative care we give us, we keep the head end raised so that by gravity it just flows down. We don't, when we just ask her to use a uh, clean diaper and that's all the treatment that is required, okay. So, as she said rightly, transverse vaginal septum, we have got to make sure that that's the diagnosis. Probably, I would ask for an MRI to make sure that that is a diagnosis. And then you would do it in such a way that you excise the septum. Here you were incising. You saw the difference? Here you were incising the imperfect anus. But in a transverse vaginal septum, you have got to excise that septum and bring about a continuity between the upper and the lower vagina. Otherwise, it will close off again or it will cause a stricture there. 
do you understand it further dyspareunia etc yes can you have the next one okay uh, then there can be an isolated cervical vaginal atresia which is a failure of the urogenital sinus to contribute to the distension of the vagina normally the patient has an ex a normal external genitalia and normal upper reproductive organs and she presents with primary amenorrhea and cyclical abdominal pain and we, uh, uh, on examination we'll uh, see a hematocorpus and investigate or a hematometra and local examination sh uh, will show a uh, normal hymenal ring no bulging membrane and vagina is seen only as a small dimple so uh, corrective surgery is very difficult uh, and their reproductive career is also not uh, really successful yeah very correct see what actually happens is uh, you will get in this situation a hematometra then you may get a hematosalphings and many times they even present with severe endometriosis and whatever you do you can never keep that upper vagina and cervix patent whatever surgery there are many people who have driven tubes through that and done many tricks under the sun but many times as atulia said you may land up doing a hysterectomy yes very unrewarding what is constitutional delay um, uh, constitutional delay is the most common cause of delayed puberty this is when adolescents lack both secondary sexual characteristic and pubertal growth even by 13 years of age so this is due to delay in the activation of gnrh uh, pulse generator and this is seen in families it runs in family because a family history of delayed puberty is seen in the mother also and here the characteristic feature is that the bone age corresponds to the developmental age and not the chronological age and can you give me an example uh example she's 15 years old uh, she's 15 years old but her bone age will correspond to 12 years 12 of years. age do you understand it corresponds to a developmental age and not to the chronological age of 15, 15 yes. do you understand so then you will know any other tip to tell you that this could be a constitutional we delay? can actually start her on uh, there is a ocps yeah, and okay. once we stop we, uh, the uh, she will still continue to menstruate that is an advantage that you get you can trigger off the menarche by giving her oc pills because everything else is okay okay she keeps growing as you wait for some more time she keeps growing very many times they tell you that my mother attained menarche only at 16 years or my sister had it only at 17 years that's a clue towards the diagnosis and then you find that initially she is infantile fetus but then she starts growing and as she keeps okay. growing you find that she slowly has got all the features and then when you trigger off with an oc pill later on she continues on her own okay so it only require the trigger yes so with now that, that we have done this constitutional delay We'll just go back to a few case presentations, right? Okay, Hena, will you give us a case? Yes, ma'am. Uh, first, uh, I'm presenting a case of Mrs. Uh, Miss Yu, a 19-year-old girl hailing from Palakkad, uh, doing her BCom second year, accompanied by her mother, belonging to low socioeconomic status. She complains of failure to attain menses. History of presenting illness: She is a 19-year-old girl who presented with complaints of failure to menstruate till date. She gives history of pubertal changes, that is, enlargement of breast from 13 years of age. And growth of pubic and axillary hair also from 13 years of age. There is no history of any cyclical abdominal pain or urinary retention so far. No history of any acne, excess of hair growth, or deepening of voice or Can hair I stop loss. You? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so why do you think she took this long to come to you? 19 years. Maybe because she got her uh, pubertal changes. Yeah, in the she got the pubertal changes. So she did not think that she should come to you. She thought probably she'll get menarche on her own. Okay. And why did you ask a history of uh, acne and hirsutism? Acne. Uh, what ran through your mind? Uh, uh, that is early onset PCOS. Very ma good. Shows. So you thought of it, whether it could be because normally PCOS gives rise to secondary amenorrhea. But sometimes in some people it can be an early onset Thank PCOS. You. Yes. What else did you ask for Hina? Uh, deepening of voice or hair loss. Uh, no history of any. But uh, do you get that much of uh, androgenic features in PCOS? No, ma'am. Deepening of voice or hair loss is seen in uh, virilizing feature, and it's seen uh, usually in uh, uh, congenital uh, adrenal hyperplasia or uh, uh, the partial AIS, that is androgen insensitivity syndrome, like. Or else, uh, an androgen. Uh, androgen secreting, secreting tumors. Secreting tumors of the. Uh, say I told you, androgens are only two sources. Either it's your ovary or it's adrenals. So it could be some androgen secreting mm -hmm. tumors of the adrenal gland. Yeah, nice. But I'll, I'll let me correct you in one thing: hair loss can also occur in PCOS. Okay. When the androgen levels are high, so in PCOS we can get hirsutism, acne, and hair loss. Male pattern. But yeah, but you will find that uh, and that hair loss may not be alopecia, mm. but there can be excessive hair loss. When there's alopecia, what is the type of uh, alopecia you get in PCOS? Temporal. Uh, uh, male the pattern. The frontal line is preserved. Underline. That is important in a PCOS patient. The frontal hairline is preserved. There could be a temporal 
uh, hair loss. Do you understand, right? What's the next history you asked? No for? history of uh, headache, vomiting, or uh, visual disturbances. Why? Uh, to rule out CNS tumors, ma'am, which may affect the hypothalamus or pituitary axis. No. Uh, uh, CNS tumors, which may affect the hypothalamus pituitary what axis. What tumors? Like pituitary adenomas, craniopharyngiomas. Yes, certainly. So you will have to ask for anything with any space occupying lesions there also, which can give rise to headache, visual disturbances, and uh, yeah. a most important. A headache, vomiting. So vomiting. that tells you there could be some space occupying lesion. Then no history of any fatigue or palpitation. No history of any cold or heat intolerance. Why? This is to rule out uh, thyroid disorders. Okay, very good. So in what type of thyroid is it? Uh, in a, uh, Hy hypothyroidism, oh, especially uh, primary hypothyroidism, yes. they can present with these features. Very good. Very good. No, then, no history of any weight gain, loss of appetite, eating disorders or excessive exercise. Why? Eating disorders like anemia, uh, that is uh, nervosa and uh, bulimia can cause uh, actually hypothalamus uh, dysfunction. So, anorexia, nervosa and bulimia. So, but remember one thing, most of the time it occurs with the, and causing a secondary amenorrhea. Because you must remember that whenever there is any eating disorder or anything like that, it is normally a hypothalamic cause. You understand? So, you can normally it causes a secondary amenorrhea. Very good. Because she is already 19 years old. Good enough. Right. No history of any swelling in the groin. No history of any discharge from the nipple. No history of loss of smell perception or hearing loss. Can you tell me why you asked all this? No history of swelling in the groin. Because descended testis can be lodged in the inguinal uh, Very good. canal. Very good. Uh, any, uh, no history of any discharge from nipple. Like senin. Uh, senin androgen. In such in such syndrome. Yes. Uh, no history of any discharge from nipple to rule out uh, galactoria that is in hyperprolactinemia. But what is the normal combination with prolactin? Hyperprolactinemia, Hyper do you see? Amenorrhea, uh, in, uh, hypothyroidism. Yeah. So, normally, whenever there is a hyperprolactinemia, it's a galactoria amenorrhea syndrome. Do you understand? Yes. It can happen. And again, that normally causes a secondary amenorrhea. amenorrhea. It doesn't cause a. Uh, what is a normal prolactin level, Satulia? 20, 21. Yes, uh, yes, can you tell me, uh, Gopika? Less than 25. And what is called mild hyperprolactinemia? 25, so, to, 25 50, to 50, 50. we call it as mild. 50 Between 50 to 100, 100 is, moderate. is moderate. And more than 100 is severe, uh, high grade, that is if severe. It, if it is more than 100, what would you do, Gopika? MRI. MRI yeah, it could be a microadenoma or it could be a macroadenoma of the prolactin gland. Okay, So, it is important, um, uh, you have got to find out whether there is a pituitary adenoma, microadenoma or a Macroadenoma has got to be ruled out when the patient has got. So, as I rightly said, and what is the normal drug that you give? Bromocryptin or cabagolin can be given. And uh, any side effect of cabagolin? Yeah, hypertrophic valvular heart disease is one of the side effects of a uh, of giving a cabagolin for long. Do you understand cabagolin for long? So, that is one of the problems that is associated. And it is also said that one of the commonest conditions you get a hyperprolactinemia is drug induced, especially anti-epileptic drugs or even following an epileptic convulsion. So, in all these conditions, they say that when it is a drug associated hyperprolactinemia, it does not respond to your yeah, anti-prolactin yeah. drugs. Do you understand? Especially cabagolin, right. What is the next history you asked for? No history of any uh, loss of smell perception or hearing loss. Uh, this Why? is uh, seen in a uh, loss of smell perception is seen in uh, Coleman syndrome. Eh? Yeah, Coleman syndrome you can get in anosmia. Anosmia. Primary amenorrhea and anosmia. Very good. Then? Then uh, hearing loss uh, again can be associated with uh, Turner syndrome, Perrault syndrome. Perrault syndrome. Now, then we will tell you what that is later on. Okay. So, you will find gonadal dysgenesis and a uh, sensory neural def deficit. So, that is what you find in a Perrault so, these are the, some of the histories that you should normally be taking in a case of primary amenorrhea because we are trying to come to a diagnosis what the possible cause could be, right? There is no history of any trauma to head or brain infections in the childhood. No history of... Why? Uh, again, this can indirectly cause a hypothalamic, uh, that is CNS injury and hypothalamic suppression. Yeah, yeah, now hypothalamic suppression. Any fractures, base of skull, you understand all these conditions, yes? No history of any radiotherapy or chemotherapy in the past. Why? Chemotherapy, uh, cer certain chemotherapy drugs like uh, the are uh, highly toxic to the ovaries. Yes. Uh, such as uh, chlorambucil, cyclophosphamide, melphalan, uh, busulfan. Very good. These are the drugs which are commonly found to be uh, oocyte toxic. Highly toxic. Highly toxic. And uh, radiotherapy? 
uh, radiotherapy uh, because uh, uh, more than uh, two rads itself uh, can cause directly to the ovary. directly to the ovary can cause premature ovarian insufficiency and uh, more than 40 years uh, more than six rads can cause ovarian failure as such yeah. that is one of the reasons why we always try whenever there is a radiation to the pelvis we try to protect the ovary by keeping Let's them see. at a higher level to reduce the direct radiation okay right next yes. coming to birth and developmental history she is born of non consanguineous marriage term institution vaginal delivery she had a birth weight of 2.8 kilograms and sex at birth was female there was no history of any developmental or mental abnormalities she had average scholastic performance no history of any childhood illnesses coming to past medical and surgical history she is known case of hypothyroid on uh, thyronom 50 micrograms daily no history of any diabetes hypertension heart disease or seizure disorder no history of any childhood tuberculosis or mumps no history of any surgeries in the past coming to family history her mother attained menarche at the age of 14 years she has a younger sister 12 years of age and she has a younger brother as well there's no history of any mental retardation or autism in family no history of primary amenorrhea in the family no history of any what is the condition which can cause primary amenorrhea in families that is uh, syndromes like fra fragile x syndromes androgen insens insensitivity so, syndrome ais the fragile x all this runs in family. family so you must get a family history no history of any genetic disease or congenital anomalies in the family Person history is within normal limits. Makes a diet, good appetite. She has adequate sleep. Bowel and bladder habits are regular, and no addictions. Okay, good. Coming to general physical examination, patient was examined after getting consent for examination. Moderately built and nourished, and cooperative. She has a height of 155 centimeters, weight of 50 kilograms, and BMI of 22.2 kilogram per meter square. Arm span is 152 centimeters. Can I just stop you? Yes, ma'am. What is the relevance of height, arm span? What does it tell you? uh height uh, short stature uh, amenorrhea with a short stature can be seen in uh, uh, syndromes like turner syndrome and also in pituitary dwarfism uh, arm span is uh, important because uh, usually uh, arm span is lesser than height within uh, uh, almost about 5 uh, cm so the arm span is about 5 cm lesser than the height, height. normally yes uh, and what are the conditions in which the arm span is increased increase in, in uh, syndromes like uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome klinefelter syndrome and also uh, morphinoid uh, morphin syndrome uh, arm span is uh, longer than and height. in all hypogonadic states hypogonadotrophic states you will find that the arm span could be reduced yes. you understand right so it is very important so what all did you say in ais in klein filters, filters in morphinoid kind and hypogonad uh, hypogonadic states okay right uh, no pallor ictus cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy or edema in the lower limbs no stigmata of turner seen no acne or histrotism or deepening of voice breast is normal tanner stage 5 uh, development no galactoria seen thyroid is normal spine and gait is normal skin over the spine and lower back is also normal how is the skin has she got hair is this uh, skin is normal ma'am it's not dry or coarse it's she's got normal hair normal hair yeah that's important because it tells me another differential diagnosis that's why right then then uh, coming to uh, uh, secondary sexual characteristic a uh, breast is tanner stage 5 pubic hair tanner stage 5 and axillary hair is normal normal vital so she is an adult with normal secondary, secondary sexual, sexual characteristics. characteristics coming to white so indirectly tells you uh, that she has a uh, good uh, estrogen and, and uh, so androgen. when good estrogens meaning good ovaries good ovaries. ovaries coming to vital patient is afebrile her uh, pulse rate is 86 beats per minute regular in rhythm normal in volume and character no radio radial or radio femoral delay BP is 110 over 70 mm of mercury in right arm sitting position respiratory rate is 17 uh, per minute why did you ask for a delay in upper limb lower limb because uh, in uh, conditions like turner syndrome there is coarctation of quietation, iota which quietation. can cause a uh, radio radio delay yeah then coming to systemic examination was within normal limits cardiovascular system s1 s2 heard normally no added sounds cns perception of smell is normal no visual field defects no other focal neurological deficits okay. respiratory system uh, normal uh, breath sounds heard no added sounds skeletal muscular system spine and gait was normal very good coming to abdominal examination uh, abdomen is uh, on inspection abdomen is flat umbilical center inverted all quadrants move equally with respiration no visible masses seen hernial orifice, uh, orifices appears to be normal on palpation abdomen is soft no masses palpable no organomegaly auscultation bowel sounds are heard okay coming to examination of external genitalia we uh, as said earlier normally what all would you look at without don't look at your slide uh, we normally. look at uh, the mons pubis and the pubic hair distribution okay. we look at the clitoris if yes. there is any clitoromegaly 
Uh, we look at the labia majora, minora, again the hair distribution and also if there is any uh, labial fusion or labioscrotal fusion. fusion. We look at the urethral opening, if okay. the urethral opening is seen separate, the vaginal opening, there is a hymenal opening okay. and also the perineum and anal opening if it is separate. Very good, excellent and also whether the hymen is perforated. Perfect. Hymen is perforated or not, yes, okay right. Then uh, here in in my case, pub patient has pubic hair, tano stage 5, mons pubis, labia majora and minora appears normal for age. No clitoromegaly seen, there is no labial swelling or labial scrotal fusion. Urethral orifice is seen separately. Perineum and anal opening is also seen normally. But vagina is seen, which is to, uh, seen to be blind denting. Per rectal examination. One minute. Uh, you said you used the word clitoromegaly. What is a clitoral index? What have you, have you heard uh, about? Clitoromegaly is, uh, is defined as a length of clitoris more than 1 centimeter or a clitoral index that is length in the breadth more than 35 millimeter square. Very good. So, when that is enlarged, what does it tell you indirectly? Uh, that is, it, it's a feature of virilizing. It's a virilizing features. Can I ask you what is uh, the virilizing features in a girl? That will include labioscrotal fusion, Very good. Uh, clitoromegaly, Very good. Uh, atrophy of the breast. Yes. Uh, that is features of hysterotism, uh -huh. male uh, pattern of baldness and also a uh, deepening of voice. Voice and muscle mass. You will find like a female wrestler. So, what is it that you found positive in this girl? A uh, 19 year old girl, known case of hypothyroidism, presented with complaints of not attaining menarche with no significant past or family history. General and systemic Can examination. I stop you? Uh, when you say that, because you are given so much of importance to hypothyroidism, then you should have said about her IQ also. Why? Because? Because she, she is having average scholastic performance. Yeah, so she should say that, you know, even her EQ is important, emotional IQ is important. Do you understand? So, because you said that with a normal IQ, IQ. then I would have known that you are not talking about primary uh, hypothyroid because you have given importance to prayer Otherwise, I would not have asked you this. Okay. Right. Uh, general and systemic examination was with the normal limits, normal secondary sexual characteristics seen, examination of external genitalia revealed tanner stage 5 pubic hair and blind ending vagina. Parectal examination did not reveal a uterus. So, diagnosis is primary amenorrhea, most probably MRKH syndrome. Why did you say that? Uh, because uh, here uh, there is the she is having normal sec normal secondary sexual. That means she's got a normal ovary. Okay. Now since she's got a normal ovary, what do you think her chromosomal sex was? Is XX. XX. Uh, can I ask you, Hinnam? Uh, normally, when the gonads are ovaries, you should be getting because uh, all of us must understand a few concepts. Okay. When the uh, chromosome is XX. That means her gonads are ovaries for sure. And if the ovary has developed well, that means she has got two X's. So, this goes without any uh, problem. Okay, when the gonads are testis, the chromosome will be X, Y. y. So, in other words, when the chromosome is X, Y, the gonads are testis. testis. That's for sure. But what is very important to remember is whenever the gonads are testis, the testis secretes something called AMH. AMH. Anti-mullerian hormone. hormone or it is always also called the mullerian inhibiting factor. factor. So, whenever there is a testis, you will find there is a mullerian inhibiting factor. That is the reason why men do not have uterus because they have got a testis and it secretes mullerian inhibiting hormone and you do not find. But in this condition, why is it that the, uh, the chromosome is actually X, X? The gonad is the ovary and how come there is no uterus? This is because of uh, two mechanisms. One is because a uh, mutation of the AMH receptors as such and another is because of a uh, mutation uh, that is a deficiency of galactose 1-phosphate uh, uridyl transferase deficiency. This causes uh, galactosemia which itself suppresses the development of uterus. uterus. So, actually we do not know the reason to tell the truth but as uh, Henna rightly said because of the mutation in this called uh, galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase, you find there is a lot of galactose. So, there is galactosemia and it is said that even when they you know, injected a lot of galactose into mice etc., the uterus did not develop. So, whenever there is a galactosemia, you can have a problem in which the uterus does not develop. That is one. And as you rightly said, it could be due to a mutation in the AMH, AMH. receptors. So, you find that there is a lot of anti mullerian a hormone. Mm -hmm. So, you find that the mullerian system, which is other words, the uterus, 
the fallopian tubes and the upper vagina does not develop. So then what is this blind vagina which she has got from where does it develop? It develops from the urogenital sinus ma'am because uh, uh, the upper vagina develops from the mullerian system and the lower vagina distal one third develops from the urogenital sinus. So there will be uh, 1.5 to 2 inches of uh, dimple of vagina left. Correct. So the entire mullerian system has not developed. All what is developed is only from the urogenital sinus. Now, um, any other features this person could have, uh, Hina? Uh, MRKH, MRKH syndrome uh, is uh, associated with uh, uh, renal abnormalities and skeletal abnormalities. Very good. Almost 50, uh, uh, renal abnormalities are seen in almost 15 to 30 percentage, which can be seen as uh, renal unilateral renal agenesis, horseshoe kidney, pelvic kidney or ectopic kidneys. And skeletal abnormalities are seen in almost 15 percentage and this can be seen as scoliosis, uh, sacral. Have you got slides on this? Uh, no, no, ma'am. Okay. So, what are the uh, skeletal abnormalities a person with MRK can have? Uh, she can have scoliosis. She can have sc uh, sacralization of lumbar bone or lumbar uh, lumbarization of the sacral, sacral bone. bone. Uh, and also, uh, this is associated with uh, a syndrome called also Klippel Field syndrome, syndrome, which is uh, associated with uh, hemivertebra and neurological deficits. Almost in uh, common, it is seen uh, mullerian agenesis is uh, related with renal dysplasia, cervical thoracic, somatic dysplasia as well. So, commonly, you find in what percentage of cases do you find a skeletal abnormality? Fifteen percent. Fifteen percent renal abnormalities. In uh, almost thirty percent. It's almost thirty percent. You understand? So, it is important that when you see a person with a blind vagina and a a uh, person who is uh, tall with secondary sexual characteristics etc. Remember to check out her skeletal system, check out her spines, you can check out her pelvis, find out whether she has got any other problem okay and then you can even do an MRI etc. and find out if there is any other issues and also check out her renal system okay. Is there any types in this? There are two types type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is uh, symmetrical that is it causes uh, it has a rudimentary uterus but normal fallopian tubes. And uh, type uh, B is uh, ty type 2 is uh, asymmetrical that is it has rudimentary uterus along with abnormal fallopian tubes. And the second one is more associated with uh, renal and uh, skeletal abnormalities. abnormalities. But can you tell me something about the hypoplastic or asymmetrical uterus? They will not be in endometrial uh, cap lining. lining. They will not be. So, it, there is no way of it responding to uh, any kind of hormonal changes. Do you understand? So, they won't. That is why it is called infantile or rudimentary uterus. You can just find a small cord like structure and in fact that helps us later in developing the vagina actually. Okay. So, this is these are the commonest problems. So, there is a type 1 and there is a type 2 and as she said the type 2 is commonly associated with renal and um, uh, skeletal abnormalities. Uh, now, let me ask you uh, uh, Atulia, if, now that there is no uh, vagina that is in other words a blind vagina she said rightly that part of the vagina which is developed from the urogenital sinus is only there. The upper part of the Mullerian system is not there. Is there any other DD you can think of? Yes ma'am. Uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome. Uh, it is basically also, it is also known as a testicular feminization syndrome. It is a disorder of androgen action. That is, it is uh, also called male pseudo hermaphroditism. Uh, the genotype will be male. That is 46XY and the phenotype will be female. One minute. So, the gonads are? Male. Male. That is why she said it is a male Pseudohomo, that was the earlier terminology, okay. Then there is another one terminology which you said? Uh, the andro, uh, testicular feminization syndrome. The testicular feminizing, that means the, uh, the gonads are testis, but phenotypically she is a female. You understand, that is why it is called testicular feminizing syndrome. But now that terminology is also gone and we call it as the androgen yes. insensitivity. What is the meaning of that word androgen insensitivity? Uh, the uh, androgen receptors are... Uh, not normal, not responding well to androgen. So, the peripheral androgenic receptors, that is important. The peripheral androgenic receptors, they do not respond to androgen. the androgens. So, what is the level of androgens? What is the normal level of androgens? Um, testosterone levels more than 10. Normally, we say about 20 to 80 20. nanogram per ml. Do you understand? But in females with AIS, it is very high levels. More than it can go 200, 300 and all that nanograms per ml. So, it is important that you know that the levels of androgens are very high. But unfortunately, the periphery is insensitive. But because of the testis, what is the other thing the testis produces? Uh, because of the androgens, it gets co uh, converted into estrogen and that is how the breast develops. Okay, very good. Then anything else the testis produces? Anti, uh, Anti Mullerian hormone, AMH. Because of that, the Mullerian system is not developed. Do you understand? So, that is the reason why the Mullerian system is not developed. And these high levels of androgens, they go to the periphery and they cause 
peripheral conversion to estrogen and that little endogenous estrogen is what actually causes the to have a little breast development. What are the other features? Tell us. Then uh, uh, the uterus cervix and the fallopian tube is absent. The gonads will be testis and which produce testosterone and hence estrogen and hence the breast develop Tanner stage 3. And uh, the, the breast will Why be doesn't it develop beyond that? Because endogenous estrogen. No. Uh, Just because she doesn't have progesterone. Oh, yeah. So that is the reason why when you give um, uh, HRT for these patients, there are some people who say that even though she has no uterus, normally when there is no uterus, when you give HRT, you need to give only estrogens. But if you add a little uh, progesterone, she'll get a little better development of the breasts. You understand? So her breast development will go only as far as uh, max 3. Do you understand tanners? Yes. Uh, but she'll have a pale areola with a small nipple and the external genitalia will be well formed uh, with a vagina of variable length. Uh, so, uh, there, are, there is a classification for androgen insensitivity, which is called the Sinecure's classification. There are five types of androgen insensitivity syndrome. Type 1 is a normal male phenotype with impaired spermatogenesis. Uh, type 2 is male genitalia with hypospadias, a micro penis, and a bifid scrotum. This is known as Riefenstein syndrome. Type 3 is uh, uh, ambiguous genitalia. Type 4 is female genitalia with virilization, like clitromegaly and partial labial fusion. And type 5 is a complete AIS with a, a normal female phenotype. Okay. Now, can I ask you, um, Hina, what are the conditions which can give rise to a, a virilizing puberty? Virilize she said there is an ambiguous genitalia here. Uh, a partial, uh, this is complete AIS. Partial AIS, androgen insensitivity syndrome can cause virilizing Very puberty. Good. So, there is something called a partial. Can, can I stop you now, Hina, and ask uh, Atulia, what is partial AIS? This in which you will find there is a partial response of the periphery to the androgens. So, what actually happens is she will have a little, everything will be just like an AIS, but she will have a little hair development, a little pubic hair, a little axillary hair. She can have a little hair here and there, whereas an AIS we normally call them Miss India's. Do you know why? Because there is, she is so beautiful, she is tall. phenotypically a female. She is so tall because, you know, she has got a lot. We said some time back, the mm -hmm. height is more, you understand? And she's, she's got lovely skin without any hair. So, that's a kind of, her breast is not voluptuous. She's got only up to Tanner stage 3. So, she's got the typical, the zero, the zero size, which everybody wants. So, she's got just enough breast tissue. And then, but she's actually fooling the world. Why? Because she's, she's got a blind vagina and she's a male with a gonad, which is the, uh, male, is. the male hormone. Do you understand? So, the incomplete variety is actually one in which you've got little hair development. That is the only difference. But what is the difference in management of AIS complete and incomplete? Atulia? Now, investigations, uh, we have to look for the levels of FSH and LH first. Then okay. we have to see the levels of serum testosterone and do a karyotyping. Okay. And uh, management is uh, basically vaginoplasty. And uh, we do a gonadectomy uh, and uh, depending on the type of AIS, whether it is complete or partial, we do a gonadectomy and the time is decided depending on whether it is complete or partial. And uh, when will you do it in the complete? Complete we do it like after puberty. <laughs> so you can do it after 16 or 18 years because we are trying to take as okay. much of endogenous hormones as it. You said some time back, no, that your androgens go to the periphery and get converted to estrogens. So, you make use of the entire gamut of uh, uh, hormones which you can get from that. And normally, it is said that these do not go for malignant change before 16, 18 years. But why why are we doing the gonadectomy earlier in the incomplete variety? Partial one because the virilization becomes... Uh, yeah, the virilization because it's partially sensitive. So, sometimes she may talk like a male. Okay. Do you understand? She develops virilizing because there is partial sensitivity of the periphery. Mm -hmm. So, she develops a little hair, she develops a little virilizing features and then after some time her friends will look at her with the difference because she has got a hoarseness of voice. And let me tell you, among all this, the hoarseness of voice is the last to disappear and sometimes may not even disappear. Even if the other features disappear. So, because of the androgenic features or the virilizing features which occur early, we knock off that gonad earlier. So, in the partial variety, we knock off the uh, gonad early mm -hmm. and in the AIS complete variety, we knock it off later on. Okay, right. Now, you said some time back, no, that she's got a blind vagina and you will do a vaginoplasty. What is a vaginoplasty? What are the various types? What, is, what can uh, you do? 
vaginoplasty we have the mckindo vaginoplasty uh, uh, where we create a trans we put a transverse incision at the lower end of the labia majora we dissect between the bladder and the rectum cut and you also cut the median raphe for a better depth and keep a mold covered with either split uh, skin graft or nowadays it is interseed is used it is a mckindo vaginoplasty then we have the lapis. can i just uh, digress on that so mckindo's vaginoplasty is the best do you understand because it we are actually creating a neo vagina between the bladder on top and the rectum below okay and after you create that new new space you actually line it with a split skin graft later on as time goes by you'll find even the vaginal cytology comes back to normal it is so beautiful you understand but now we have found out that there are better uh, ways in which we can give a better vagina to them and thereby the developments have changed you understand so the interseed actually does not fall under the mckindo's because in mckindo's it's a split skin graft so you can see the modified mckindo now we use the interseed, interseed. which is nothing but oxidized uh, so cellulose, cellulose. Oxidized cellulose. Yes. Uh, then uh, the other uh, uh, methods is laparoscopic Davidos method. That is a peritoneal pull through technique. Then there is a Vertes operation. That is laparoscopic pull up. That is a spear connected to metallic wires and it's pulled up. Then we have the ileal vaginoplasty and also the Williams procedure. That is just suturing the labia together to create a pouch like stuff. Yeah. Among all this, I will tell you that they they say that the I've never done it. The ileal vaginoplasty gives very excellent results. formerly they were using a part of the colon mm. but what yes. happened with that was infection Spatial was there and, and there was discharge. lot of discharge so now they see that they get good results with the ileal well we have been now doing the laparoscopic approaches and we are quite uh, getting used to it and we are quite happy with the results we have got with it because the depth of vagina is so good with that you understand and what is the next you said williams what is williams that is uh, uh, approximating the labia together and creating a pouch like structure mm. So it just it's so simple. You just create on small little blind pouch. Just suture the labia together, okay? And the Frank's dilatation, uh, that is serial uh, dilatation. Dilatation. With yeah. There are people who use they use uh, stationary bicycles, and then they have got a mold on it, and they sit on it, and you know Sorry. for thirty uh, minutes a day, and they see it produces a very good vagina. I have seen people who have who have come not with sitting on these. but they have used molds because they were so frustrated after marriage not knowing what is wrong and they produced excellent vagina so i believe that if the franks dilatation if you could use you can get a good depth of vagina so these are all the various methods so basically when we go to manage any primary amenorrhea the first question we ask is can she menstruate can this woman of yours menstruate we should counsel them about their menstrual reproductive and sexual functions that is the three test three things you'll have to discuss or counsel them with yes, so she can she menstruate no, no. She, she can never menstruate two then her uh, can she have sexual, uh, sexual contact with the husband with vaginoplasty with the vaginoplasty she can have sex with the husband third and reproductive function she'll have to go for a ovum uh, donation and surrogacy Oh, that is very good. So she can donate her oocytes and, and go for surrogacy. surrogacy. Now today, what is the best option which your uterine transplant is? Yeah, a uterine transplant can be done. You can send them to Pundam Baker, and you'll find that he can do a uterine transplant, but the queue is very long. Now, uh, so the vaginoplasty is common for uh, MRK as well as for AIS. Do you understand? Now, after this, what Henna? Uh, what is the management apart from vaginoplasty for a person with? Uh, in MRK syndrome, uh, first uh, uh, that is uh, vaginoplasty addresses the issue of uh, sexual function for the uh, patient. Uh, we should counsel her about uh, her uh, mens uh, menstrual function and uh, reproductive function as well. But she can't have menses. She doesn't. Uh, she doesn't have an uh, uterus. She can't have a mens. Uh, she won't be having menses. We have to counsel her about that. And about reproductive, since she has normal ovaries, she can go for uh, donor oocyte. That is, she can uh, donate her oocytes and opt for surrogacy. And uh, nowadays, the uh, according to the latest developments, she can also go for uterine transplantation. Okay, so that is the option which a person with MRK can. Now, a patient with AIS, she has also got a blind vagina. You have done a vaginoplasty. What are the other things you have already done? A gonadectomy, a vaginoplasty. Then what else will you do for this person with AIS? Uh, we have to Androgen insensitivity. Yes, ma'am. We have to give a hormone replacement, and uh, her reproductive career, she'll have to go for uh, adoption or. Uh, service and uh, adoption she like to go for adoption. adoption that is a problem because she cannot have uh, she hasn't got a gonads it's only the uh, testes which we have removed so you will have to do a gonadectomy a vaginoplasty and hrt hrt okay so if at all she wants to have a child she'll have to go for an adoption, adoption. okay right coming to the uh, second case 
uh, we have uh, Miss A, a 16 year old girl studying in 10th standard, hailing from Malapuram. She is accompanied by her mother, belonging to middle socioeconomic status. Again, she presented to us with a failure to attain Manake. Uh, history of presenting illness. Again, she is a 16 year old girl presented with uh, complaints of failure to menstruate. Her mother gives history of uh, pu uh, that is uh, pubertal changes. That is, she had enlargement of breasts from the age of 13 years and growth of pubic and axillary hair also from 13 years of age. There was no history of cyclical abdominal pain, no history of any headache, vomiting, visual disturbance or hair loss, no history of any fatigue or palpitation, change of voice or excessive hair growth, no history of loss of smell perception, no history of any brain infections in childhood, no history of any trauma or medications in the past, no history of radiotherapy or chemotherapy in the past. Coming to birth and developmental history, history was elicited from the mother. She was born of a non consanguineous marriage. She was a, a lower segment caesarean section, delivered at term, and the indication for caesarean was a previous uh, caesarean. There was no history of any complex surgeries or surgeries in childhood concerning the genital urethane system so far. No, development, uh, no developmental or mental abnormalities. She had average scholastic performance. Uh, past medical and surgical history, she is a hypothyroid on thyronum 100 micrograms. No history of any diabetes, hypertension or heart disease. No history of any liver disease or autoimmune disease like SLE. No history of any childhood tuberculosis or mumps. No history of any surgeries in the past. So that is all self-explanatory. Okay, yes. right. Coming to family history, again her mother attained uh, Menake at the age of 14. She has an elder brother and he has normal height and IQ. No history of any primary amenorrhea or gynecological malignancy or genetic disease or congenital anomalies in the family. Coming to personal history, it's within normal limits. Coming to general physical examination, patient was examined after getting consent for examination. She is moderately built and nourished and cooperative. Her height is 135 centimeters, weight of 45 kilograms, BMI of 24.69 kilogram per meter square. One minute. So, what is it that you have noticed so far? Her height. She is short. She is short. Her height is only 135 centimeters. 135. Then arm span is uh, normal, 131 centimeters. There is no pallor, ictris, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy or edema in the lower limbs. Okay. She is short statured, webbing of neck, low hairline, low set ears, very poor nipple and widely spaced nipple seen with a wide carrying angle. There so, was, what all has she got? She has, uh, she is short statured, she has webbing of neck, neck, low hairline, okay. low set ears, okay. very poor nipple and which is widely spaced okay. and a wide carrying angle. Okay. There was no other skeletal abnormality seen, no acne, hysterotism or dip, deepening of voice, breast was standing at stage 1, no oh, galactoria. She is 16 years old and her breast Mrs. development Oli, is only standard stage, stage 1. one. No galactoria seen, no exalthomas or uh, thyroid enlargement seen, okay. spine and gait was within normal limits. Okay. Coming to her secondary sexual characteristics, her breast shows only standard stage 1 development with poor nipple which is widely spaced. Pubic hair is... What does this indirectly tell you? She has very poor estrogen exposure. Yeah, she has got very little estrogen. So, that tells you that her Gonads. source of estrogen is probably the ovary ovaries and the ovaries are, are poor. Not functioning. Pubic hair is again standard uh, stage 1. Axillary hair is sparse. Vitals, uh, patient is afebrile. Her heart rate is 72 beats per minute. Regular in rhythm, normal in volume and character. No radio radial or radio femoral delay. BP was 110, of, uh, 110 over 70 millimeters of mercury, respiratory 16 beats uh, per minute, breaths per minute. Uh, systemic examination, cardiovascular system is within normal limits, S1, S2 hurt, no murmurs or added sounds. CNS, perception of smell is normal, no visual field defects or uh, focal neurological deficits. Respiratory system was within normal limits. Okay, can I stop you now? Yes, ma'am. Uh, see, basically, whenever you talk about a case of primary amenorrhea, these are few things which you have to think of. One is you must tell about the general build of the patient. Then look out at the secondary sexual characteristics which you have actually picked up and you have written. And next look out for any stigma. So basically you cannot forget these three things. The general structure of the patient as you see it you will have to say. Then talk in reference with the secondary sexual characteristics and talk whether there is any stigma or whatever disease. Right. That you rightly said. Right. Then uh, coming to abdominal examination, it is within normal limits, no ma mass is palpable, no organomegaly. Uh, coming to examination of just external genitalia, uh, her pubic hair is standard stage 1. Mons pubis, labia majora, labia minora appears normal for age. There was no clitoromegaly or no labial swelling. Urethral and vaginal openings. Uh, do you think it could have been normal for age or do you think a little hypoplastic? Because for to get a very good labia, etc., you require good, good estrogen. 
don't you find that a menopausal woman her actually her labia is all shrunken and shriveled mm. so you would have got some Hyper, amount of hypoplasia so you can't really call it normal, normal. right urethral uh, and vaginal opening seen separately perineum and anal opening uh, seen and which it was uh, within normal limits per vaginal examination was not done per rectal examination reveals a small nodule uh, nodule but even antigrade. though you do not do a vaginal examination you can actually look out at the hymenal opening hymenal opening was the it same yeah vaginal so opening seen separately is seen, that is important so she said the urethral opening is seen the hymenal opening two very very important points okay very good uh, per rectal examination reveals a small nodule anteriorly uh, the infantile uterus was palpated was it okay coming to the summary and you have not done a per vaginal, per vaginal examination, examination. Uh, summary a 16 year old girl known case of hypothyroidism 16 year old 16 year old girl Known case of hypothyroidism with normal IQ, presented with complaints of not attaining menarche with no significant past or family history. On examination, she is short statured, stigmata of Turner's present with BMI of. No, you cannot say stigmata. You cannot tell me the diagnosis now. Okay. So what do you find? Short statured, short statured, low set ears, low set ears, uh, low set ears, low hairline, widely spaced uh, nipples, and poor uh, nipple was seen. Uh, breast development of tanner stage one, pubic hair tanner stage one with sparse uh, axillary hair uh, was seen, and normal hypoplastic female external genitalia was noted. Systemic examination was within normal limits, and per rectal examination showed a hypoplastic uterus. Hypoplastic uterus, and also important to tell me that you have seen the hymen opening. opening. Hymen opening also you have seen. That's look like to Roman galley. So, uh, what is your diagnosis? Is uh, primary amenorrhea, uh, probably Turner syndrome, since she has. Uh, it particularly shows the stigmata of Turner syndrome. She's got a lot of stigma, stigmata, which could be Turner because Turner she's a 16 year old. Uh, and I always tell myself that the way to remember a Turner's is she is a female, but she's got only a streak gonad, right? So because of that, she is less of a female. So in every way, she is a female. In other words, she is not tall; she is just shortish. She hasn't got good breasts; she's got poor breasts. Okay, her external genitalia, she is a female, but it's a little mm -hmm. hypoplastic. She's got a uterus, but less of a female. She's got a small uterus. She's got a, she's got an ovary, but it's a small ovary. Do you understand? So think of this. This is one word to remember at Turner's. Can you tell me what are the other features of Turner's? Because Turner's by itself is a is a huge thing to remember. So can you tell us ways Turner's, to remember the features of Turner's? Turner's uh, from uh, starting from uh, head uh, up to down. We have uh, eyes. Uh, we have epicanthal fold. Folds could be there. There okay. is a strabismus, amblyopia, color blindness, which is use, uh, usually red green a color strabismus blindness. Strabismus meaning she's got squint. squint. Okay, then. Uh, then ptosis also may be seen. She could have ptosis. Then she could have. Uh, then coming to ears, she will have a low set ears. She can have even color blindness. Color blindness, which is uh, red green. Red green blindness, color blindness. Okay, then. Coming to ears, it might be low set ears with yeah. associated with sensory neural uh, hearing loss. Very good. Uh, and occasionally. Uh, of uh, often otitis media is also seen uh, low hairline uh, high arched palate webbed neck shield like chest with widely spaced nipple can i ask you something yeah. this uh, webbed neck which you see in utero does it could it have shown something uh, increased uh, nuchal translucence no webbed neck a cystic hygroma cystic hygroma hygroma normally they say that uh, in utero we may say these children with turners with a cystic hygroma Okay, not empty. Okay. okay, right. Then, then cardiovascular system can show a variety of changes, which include coagulation of aorta. So she's got a lot of these stigma, and that is quite positive in this lady also, isn't yes, it? In this girl. Mm. Uh, serious uh, changes would include a uh, coagulation of aorta. Serious meaning cardiovascular. Cardiovascular system, bicuspid aortic valve, uh, aortic root dilatation, aortic aneurysm, aberrant right subclavian artery, uh, persistence of left uh, superior vena cava, uh, pulmonary venous return anomalies, long arch of aorta. And especially in pregnancy, it may be associated with aortic dissection, which is important while counseling the patient, uh, because uh, a patient who has cardiovascular disease is advised against pregnancy. If, and if at all you wanted to go become pregnant, you better check out if you got an aortic aneurysm and a coagulation, because you can have problems with these girls. Okay, right? Because you may lose the patient; they may die in labor. Because how would you have got her to become pregnant? By the way. Uh, well, uh, we can uh, give her hormone replacement uh, therapy, therapy then, and uh, donor oocyte. Donor oocyte. With the donor oocyte, you could have got her to become pregnant, right? 
But it, remember, before pregnancy, you've got to check out the uh, All cardiovascular, the cardiovascular status. status. Right. Then she can have a variety of skeletal abnormalities, which includes cubitus valgus, genu valgus, wide carrying angle, scoliosis, fourth shortened metacarpals, uh, and uh, dysplastic nails. Uh, renal abnormalities may include horseshoe kidneys, duplicated kidneys, renal, uh, uh, that is pelvic kidney, uh, hydronephrosis, and unilateral renal agenesis. And uh, Turner syndrome is known to cause a uh, lot of autoimmune disease, which include Hashimoto's thyroiditis, type 1 diabetes, mellitus, uh, celiac disease, uh, vitiligo, and even uh, that is autoimmune, hypothyroidism. Autoimmune hepatitis, 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 well. hepatitis thrombocytopenia. Yes, all these conditions you can have in a person with Turner. So, a Turner has got to be thoroughly evaluated. Then anything else which you would say? Then there are cancers which are associated with Turner syndrome and this includes CA endometrium, tumors of the bladder and the CNS. The uh, CA which we don't carcinoma, which you don't see in Turner's is the breast, breast carcinoma cancer. breast. Uh, any any um, uh, psychological problems with these children? Uh, she can uh, atten uh, attention deficit uh, hyperactive disorders. So she can have attention seeking devices, you know, I mean uh, deficits and then she can also be a very hyperactive kid. So you'll have to think of all these things when you've got a Turner's in your hand. But basically, you can allow her to educate herself because, you know, she's scholastically, she's quite yeah, okay. okay. She performs well. She, she can be taught uh, an occupation. She can work, etc. And if at all she wants to get married, you can counsel the husband. See, because you can give her HR. When will you start giving her HRT, by the way? Uh, 12 to 16 years, ma'am. Uh, the, the HRT includes... Uh, I agree with you. Uh, yeah. It should not be started before 12 years. Yes. It should not be started after 15, 15 years. years. Okay. So, the ideal time to start HRT and what would you give her to start her on? We give her uh, natural estrogen that is a uh, uh, conjugated equine estrogen at a dose of uh, 0.3 to 0.6 milligrams over 6 months or we can give her uh, estrogen that is estradiol valerate which can be given from a dose of 0.5 to 1 milligram. Very good. And this is usually estrogen alone is given initially for the we first natural estrogen. natural estrogen for the first 2 to 3 years or until the first vaginal bleeding is seen. At that point of time, we add progesterone as well, and we usually add uh, medroxyprogesterone at a dose of five to ten milligrams, or the ten or, uh, for ten to twelve days. And uh, this is uh, as uh, given as HRT. And uh, since uh, uh, giving her hormones will develop a uterus, and that can and she can have a normal yeah. reproductive function provided she gets a, a donor oocyte. Donor oocyte. Can I ask you something? Could you have improved her height? Yes, ma'am. It could have been uh, it could have been improved provided this was detected early. Early. Because uh, we can give her growth hormones. How would you have detected it? Uh, genetics, pre uh, genetic when syndrome. When you found that stigma, growth. Stigma, growth Height was below, below the, the average. There is fifth centile. Below the fifth centile in height when she was growing. You found that basically she's a small girl in school. So then probably that was the time for you to start the patient on growth, growth hormone. hormone. And uh, growth hormone is given as a dose of 0.375 milligrams. And this per is kilogram uh, per, 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 uh, per kilogram body weight. Per kilogram body weight. And this is given over seven divided doses. And given until before the age of eight years. Uh, because uh, once metaphyseal closure, uh, yeah, epiphyseal closure occurs, there is no role for a growth hormone. Uh, so that is given up to uh, a time where the patient gets a height of more than 150 centimeters. Yeah. So when you attain normal height, then you can stop the growth hormone. So, it is important that you give it. You said that you are going to give the estrogens and progesterone. Would you give progesterone also? Yes, ma'am. Why? Progesterone because she has a uterus. She has got a uterus. Because if you do not give her the progesterone, when you repeatedly be giving her the estrogens, then later she on in life she can go for endometrial, endometrial carcinoma. Endometrial carcinoma. So, you will have to give her the progesterone. But how long would you give it and when would you stop it? Up to the age of menopause, ma'am. Yeah, up to the age of menopause. Till about 50 years. So, you start at 12 to 15 years and you continue giving it nothing happens she should be given to protect herself as well as her bones and everything else do you understand so she can be uh, given that till the age of menopause, menopause. okay right um, now that we have finished the, is there something else which can mimic uh, a turner's uh, yes a uh, gopika uh, there is a gonadal dysgenesis uh, which is uh, which gives almost similar feature it is it is a hypergonadotropic hypogonadism uh, it could be a pure gonadal dysgenesis or a uh, mixed gonadal dysgenesis. Very good. If it's a pure one, it is due to the abnormality of SRY gene, uh, which results in the abnormality of the gonadal uh, development. So the patient have a karyotype. Either she could be, I mean, a patient could be 46XX, or it, uh, or the patient could be a 46XY. If it is 46, can I stop you? Yes, ma'am. See, so exactly as the word says, it's pure gonadal dysgenesis. Pure gonadal dysgenesis. 
pure gonadal dysgenesis. Now, when you say that two, three times, you'll understand the meaning of what I'm trying to tell you. Because when in a turners, again, you've got a dysgenetic gonad. But we don't call it pure gonadal dysgenesis because there the chromosome is X, 45X. X. But whereas here, when we say pure gonadal dysgenesis, only the gonads are dysgenetic. Whereas the chromosomes are normal. Is it important for you to remember that? Yes. Because it could be an XX or it could be an XY. Yes. Now, when it is an XY, what is it called, uh, Gopika? If it's X XY, it is called Sweyer's syndrome. Uh, then in Sweyer's, what happens is that the failure of gonads to produce testosterone uh, and uh, the Mullerian inhibiting substance will occur. So that results in a female phenotype. So the patient will have a female phenotype in Sweyer's. And the thing is, in partial gonadal dysgenesis, it could be a unilateral or bilateral. So, it gave rise to various degree of uh, sexual ambiguity. In How do you know whether it is XX or XY? Only by doing a karyotyping. karyotyping. Please remember that there are these, this pure gonadal dysgenesis, you see a streak, you must do the karyotype. Because when you see that, when you do the karyotype only will you know whether it is Turner's 45X. If it tells you a streak with that 45, uh, 46XY, it is a Swayers. Yes. If you see a streak gonad with a 46XX, it is, it, a is a, it is a it is a pure gonadal dysgenesis. Do you understand? But why is it important for you to pick up these Swayers? Because if, it's, if there is Y chromosome, there is a high chance that there is a testis, like a, a dysgenetic testis, then you have to go for a gonadectomy. Gonadectomy. Otherwise, what will happen? Gonadoplastoma. Yeah, she can go in for a malignancy in that streak gonad. Even if it's a streak gonad, you got to. So, also in a Turner's, there is something called a mosaic Turner. Mosaic Turner in which some cell lines could be Y. That is again another condition which you will have to pick up on a karyotype and you will have to do a gonadectomy. Okay, right. Yes. So, if it is a pure gonadal dysgenesis, they will have bilateral uh, straight gonads and uh, typically the, it will be a, I mean, phenotypically uh, the patient will be a female with sexual infantilism. And, uh, and the but their height will be normal. normal. Their height will be normal. Height will be normal. Now, can anybody in this tell me uh, what is it, which part of the X chromosome causes the sexual Sox. infantilism? Sox. 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 One minute, one minute. Uh, what causes the sexual infantilism and what causes the phenotypic features of Turner's? Absence of the long arm of long the X, X chromosome, chromosome causes se uh, sexual infantilism. Yes. Absence of the long arm of the X chromosome will cause sexual, sexual infantilism. infantilism and, and absence of the short, short arm, arm of the X chromosome will cause the phenotypic, phenotypic features, features of of turners. Do you Stigma. understand? So, it is important for us to know where exactly we stand. And I kept on repeating the word pure gonadal dysgenesis because there the chromosome is normal. But we must know the chromosome because that whether to remove the gonad or not. So, swayers we should remove the gonad whereas the pure XX we do not have to remove. What is mixed gonadal dysgenesis? A mixed gonadal dysgenesis there will be a dysgenetic testis on one side and the other side there will be a straight gonad. So, the patient will have uh, an ambiguous genitalia. And the, the genotype will be 46XY. It depends. You, I can have two cell lines also. I can have an XX or an XY, XY. depending, it can be an over testis. So, I can have various combinations of that. Do you understand, right? The investigation is basically FSH, LH and karyotyping. And the treatment is, if it's a, uh, after karyotyping, if there is a Y, y chromosome and if there, is a if there is a testis, we have to go for gonadectomy, followed by HRT, uh, hormone replacement therapy. A so, for all dysgenetic gonads, they will require HRT. The only thing is whether to do the gonadectomy if there is something of a Y in that. That's all, as simple as that. But important to remember that they may have sexual infantilism, but they will have a normal height. Mm -hmm. So, in a mosaic turner as well as in pure gonadal dysgenesis, the height is normal. There may be sexual infantilism, but the height is normal. Okay, right. Yes, what are the other things which you can tell us? Uh, Gopika? There is fragile X syndrome which is associated with a gene uh, FMR1 uh, mutation. Pro, uh, so that results in intellectual disabilities uh, and uh, it's otherwise called as Fraxy syndrome, uh, Fraxic syndrome, Marker X syndrome and it's also called Martin Bell syndrome, X-linked mental retardation and the patient, uh, uh, the protein which is involved is uh, fragile X mental retardation protein and that is required for the neuronal development. So, if the patient is XY, that is male, uh, this is an X-link condition, so uh, the patient will be affected and if it is a female, she will be a carrier. So, so uh, that is a very important sentence. Normally, we see the fragile X in the male. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who suffer from it, okay. But 
the females and only the carriers. 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 So they will have a macro orchidism that is large testis. Uh, they will have large ears, la la long narrow face, soft uh, skin, poor eyesight, large body size, square chin, for frontal uh, bossy. And there will be developmental delay, mental retardation, delay, learning disabilities, uh, delayed speech, uh, then poor con uh, conversation skills, and good verbal, imitative skills. And uh, uh, these patients will have premature ovarian failure. Very important. So this is one of the conditions which can run in families. So you must know the features in the male, what she has told you so far. And you must find out whether it runs in the families because that woman could be carrying the uh, gene. Uh, yes. So we were talking some time back about the Coleman syndrome. Coleman syndrome is actually a condition which you've got hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. Do you know why that is important? Because a person with Coleman syndrome, if you want her to have periods, what will you give her? No, not necessary. I can give her just an estrogen and progesterone, she will get. But because of hypogonadotrophic state, if I want her to conceive, then I'll have to give her gonadotrophins. You understand? So for her to get periods, it's okay if I give estrogen progesterone. Yeah, tell us something about Coleman's so, uh, Gopika. Uh, Coleman syndrome is a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. It is an inherited as, uh, X-linked uh, condition or autosomal dominant or, or autosomal recessive condition. It is basically mutation in the Cal1 gene which is on the short term of chromosome X. And it encounters for an adhesion protein which is called anosmin 1 which is critical for Neuronal migration of both GNRS and olfactory and, neurons. And the olfactory neurons. So, this patient will present with anosmia. Other genes other than CAL1 is uh, FGF8, uh, CAL1, NELF, PROC-K1, uh, PROC-2 and PROC-R2, CHT7. There will be defective migration of GNRS and olfactory neurons. Uh, so, these patients will be having associated and midline facial defects like cleft palate, Unilateral renal agenesis, cerebellar ataxia, epilepsy, neurosensory hearing loss, and synchronesis. So these are all the problems the patient can have. But remember that it's hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. That means that FSH and LH are low in them. And so what you'll have to give them to ovulate is you'll have to give gonadotrophins. But remember to check. How do you normally check the smell? Anosmia. We can give coffee powder smell. Coffee powder or even perfume. Perfume. So when you go for the exams, you'll have to carry one of these with you and check it out. Right. Any other syndromes that you can, yes. Uh, these patients will have absence of secondary sexual characteristics and impairment of olfactory function. They'll have infertility and we can give, uh, we can make them menstruate by giving uh, estrogen and progesterone. But for ovulation induction, we have to give them gonadotropins. Very good. Now, about Perol syndrome, which is a very rare condition. Uh, this is an autosomal recessive condition which is the pure gonadal dysgenesis, that is a female karyotype, that is 46 with sensory neural hearing loss. So that is all it is, it's pure gonadal dysgenesis with sensory neural loss, hearing loss and it's called Peralt. Uh, then we have an athlete amenorrhea, which is uh, commonly seen in athletes with uh, who do intense exercise. The triad is they, they'll have menstrual uh, dysfunction, they'll have low energy availability plus or minus eating disorders and they, they'll have osteopenia. So that is a triad, which is amenorrhea, eating disorder and osteopenia. That is the athletic triad. Okay, we see that in athletes. Mm. Then the other syndrome is called lorentz moon beetle syndrome, which is again a rare condition, which is autosomal recessive condition associated with retinitis pigmentosa, pigmentosa spasmodic paraplegia, hypogonadism and mental retardation and obesity. Obesity. Uh, next syndrome is prada willi syndrome. It's a very rare condition, a genetic disorder, where there is seven genes on chromosome 15 as deleted or un unexpressed on a paternal chromosome. So they will present with uh, carbohydrate intolerance, obesity, hypotonia, hypothalamic dysfunction, delayed puberty, sleep dis disturbances, delayed milestones, short stature and cryptorchidism. Yeah, so they can also have myotonic uh, epilepsy, they say. They also say that these patients can have mental retardation, okay, Prada will, right. The next thing is a craniopharyngioma. Yeah, one word. This craniopharyngiomas are the commonest tumors, the hypothalamus. Yes. You understand? It's so important that you recognize them because that is what we commonly, whenever there is a tumor associated to the primary amenorrhea, you think of a yes. craniopharyngioma. What are the features of a craniopharyngioma? So, uh, this craniopharyngioma can cause hypothalamic compression and it can result in hypogonadism, hypoprolactinemia, diabetes insipidus and weight gain. And if it is having an optic compression, presence with optic symptoms like 
visual disturbances like right temporal hemi hemianopia. hemianopia. So you'll have to check the fields. That's one of the reasons why they ask you to check the fields in a case of primary amenorrhea to rule out a craniopharyngioma, especially pressing on the optic chiasma. Uh, then, then the next syndrome is hand shoot. No, but before that, what are the other features which is important about uh, craniopharyngiomas? Uh, You'll find they can go in for diabetic insipidus, delayed puberty. Sometimes they can even have optic atrophy, optic papilledema, etc. So they normally might present with headache and vomiting. So remember that primary amenorrhea and a tumor in the hypothalamus, you will have to think of a craniopharyngioma. Okay. What is the hand color Christian syndrome? Hand color Christian disease is a uh, spectrum of disorders like ES, this is otherwise known as eosinophilic granular. Metosis or Langerhans cell granulomatosis. It's actually a classic uh, clinical triad of diabetes insipidus, exophthalmos, and lytic bond, bond lesions. Uh, so, we do MRI to find out the lytic bond lesions, and also the findings include expensile lytic bond lesions, thickening of pituitary stalk, hypothalamic mass, meningeal enhancement, etc. Uh, there will be hypothalamic mass, so there will be uh, some involvement of the hypothalamus, and therefore the patient can present with hypogonadism. Uh, diagnosis is by biopsy of the bone lesion. And it's important when you see a person with delayed puberty, with lytic bone lesions and diabetic insipidus, etc., you'll have to think of hand those, shoot. though rare, you'll have to think of a hand skill uh, We'll see this molecular habitus with uh, so many uh, conditions. Uh, it, it has an association with the per pernolt syndrome. And it is also seen with other uh, conditions of hypogonadism. If I ask you which is the most important androgen in the body, uh, five uh, hydro uh, dihydro testosterone. testosterone. Okay, what are the other uh, androgens in the body? Uh, that is uh, the uh, androsinidion DHEAS uh, testosterone, uh, which is converted to dihydro DHEAS, DHEAS androsinidion and testosterone. And, and the most testosterone. potent is dihydro testosterone. So basically, this testosterone to be really active at the periphery, you have got to convert it into dihydrotestosterone and the hormone responsible for that is 5-alpha reductase. So when that is not there, what happens? There is no dihydrotestosterone. If I ask you Gopika, what is the important function of dihydrotestosterone? It is, it is very important to develop the external genitalia and prostate development. And the prostate development. So for two very important things you require dihydrotestosterone. One is for the development of the external male genitalia. And second is for the development of the prostate. So in its absence, you get an ambiguous genitalia. genitalia. Do you understand? So when at birth, when you find that it is an ambiguous genitalia, one of the investigations you must do is do a check out for 5-alpha reductase and see whether there is a deficiency in that. If there is a deficiency, then that problem is because that individual does not form the uh, dihydrotestosterone. So what are the other features? I am just asking, at, without looking at that, at a glance, if I am to ask you, one is ambiguous genitalia and what is the other thing? Uh, Virilizing features. features. That's the most important thing to remember. So you can get all the hoarseness of voice, uh, baldness, uh, muscle mass, clitoromegaly, and breast atrophy, all that you can have. Plus along with that you got an ambiguous genitalia. Okay. And because the and what is the uh, chromosomal sex? Uh, it's male. Me. X, 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 Y. X, Y. What is the gonadal sex? Uh, gonadal sex, it will be ambiguous genitalia. No, no. Gonads. Gonads. Gonads will be uh, testis. 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 The gonads are testis. So, what happens? Internal genitalia is because mullerian inhibiting, so there is no mullerian system. The internal genitalia is like the Wolfian system. Do you understand? And then the external genital is ambiguous, ambiguous. genitalia. The phenotype is, phenotype is female, female but with Ma uh, with, with masculinizing features. Do you understand? So, what is your management for 5 alpha so reductase? 5 alpha reductase uh, management depends upon the uh, gender of the, like the patient's choice. Yeah. If the patient prefers to be a, a male, mm -hmm. we can keep the gonads and we can uh, give 5 alpha reductase. And 5 alpha reductase, reductase or no. you can give directly uh, dihydrotestosterone also. If the patient wants to be a female, then we have to for gonadectomy and then we have to give HRT for the Very patient. good, very good. Uh, and the patient uh, about uh, thing there is a defect in the converting testosterone to dihydrotestosterone uh, because of the deficiency of the 5 alpha reductase enzyme and the patient will have a normal internal genital system you know typically uh, the patient will be a male and because genitalia will be present realization features of puberty will be there they will have testis they will have anti mullerian hormone so there will not won't be any mullerian structures there, there won't be any secondary sexual characteristics and uh, uh, 
feminized uh, external genitalia will be there and small phallus and hypospadiosis will be there. Um, next about miscellaneous rare enzyme uh, deficiencies. So uh, this is uh, this is an important chart. Uh, enzyme this is actually the steroid pathway, pathway and this is a steroid pathway which you normally see in the ovary as well as in the adrenals. Do you understand? Adrenals is a little more. There is a little more than what you see in the ovaries okay now it is important that we don't have to see the end structures but we'll see the beginning part of this only then you will understand what are the which are the enzyme deficiencies which can give rise to primary amenorrhea here the, uh, the enzymes involved are 17 alpha hydroxylase enzyme 17 20 uh, lyase enzymes lyase. and uh, there is uh, aromatase uh, there is side chain uh, con side mm. chain converting enzyme deficiency can also result in a primary amenorrhea so uh, basically the cholesterol is being converted into pregnalone inside the mitochondria and for that there should be a transfer uh, from the outer mitochondrial membrane to the inner mitochondrial membrane Correct. which is under the influence of an enzyme called uh, SCC which is side chain, side chain uh, cleavage okay. enzyme. So that if that is deficient uh, there won't be conversion of cholesterol to pregnenolone. So there won't be any, uh, any estrone or there won't be any aldosterone or cortisol for being formed. So, in that patient, uh, they will present with primary amenorrhea and, uh, and uh, various other symptoms. And uh, uh, if there is deficiency of 17 alpha hydroxylase enzyme, the pregnenolone will not be converted to 17 alpha hydroxy, uh, 17 hydroxy pregnenolone. If that is not being, uh, if uh, pregnenolone doesn't, con doesn't convert into 17 alpha hy 17 hydroxy pregnenolone, then further steps won't take exactly. place. And if uh, the 17, uh, 17 alpha, I mean both 17 will hydroxy. not happen the 17 hydroxy pregnant alone will not be there 17 hydroxy um, uh, progesterone also is not there okay and if uh, that doesn't like uh, the 17 hydroxy pregnant alone will not be converted to DHEA there is no 1720 lyase enzyme that is a rare enzyme which is involved so we'll move on to the congenital lipo adrenal so what actually enzyme. how do you find these patients they have actually got features of hypertension hypokalemia and hypernatremia do you understand so that is what you find in patients with 17 hydroxylase deficiency and 1720 lyase deficiency right so congenital hypoadrenal hypoplasia is an autosomal recessive condition which is uh, the the steroid side chain cleavage enzyme uh, that, uh, that is star regulatory protein is involved that is the deficient hormone so whenever that enzyme is deficient uh, the patient can present with hyponatremia hyperkalemia this is because the aldosterone is uh, not, I mean, it is it is not being formed. There will be acidosis in infancy. So, uh, uh, the patient will have a female genitalia. We have to supplement them with uh, mineralocorticoids and leukocorticoids. Yeah. So, here you got hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. Okay. When it, if there is 17 alpha hydroxylase and 1720 uh, lyase deficiency, uh, the genotype can be uh, 46XX or 46X5. Uh, if uh, 46 XY is the genotype, there won't be any uterus. They will present with primary amenorrhea with no secondary sexual characteristics. Their external uh, I mean, phenotype will be female and they also present with hypertension and hypokalemia. Uh, other enzyme deficiency is aromatase uh, deficiency, which is also a rare condition and autosomal recessive condition. Where do you normally require aromatase? Uh, for the peripheral con conversion of androgens. For the conversion of androgens to androgens. estrogens. So, when there is no aromatase, what happens? More amount of androgens. androgens. So, the patient will have ambiguous genitalia. They present with primary amenorrhea. Since there is no estrogen, there won't be any breast development. There will be absent growth spurt, uh, growth spurt and a delayed bondage and there will be multicystic ovaries. Uh, next, moving on to uh, other uh, conditions which could be, uh, which, uh, which can present with. Uh, level. Uh, so, ac acromegaly is one such condition. Uh, they have four features hypertrichosis, large dowry hands, and uh, the basic investigation which you can do is insulin growth factor 1 level yeah. can be estimated. So, insulin like growth factor 1 will be very raised yeah. in these patients. As all of you all know, acromegaly, they are huge, tall people with coarse features mm -hmm. and hypertrichosis, okay, dowry hands. Then we have the Cushing syndrome, which is again obesity, patient presence with obesity, hypertension, purple stride, proximal muscle weakness, buffalo hump, uh, all the classic features of uh, Cushing syndrome. And uh, the test which, which we can do is a high dose TEXA suppression test. If we give a small dose, the cortisol level will be very high. If we give a high dose, the level will be very low. That's how we differentiate. And apart from this, the patient will also have features of 
hypertension, uh, you've got hirsutism, etc., proximal muscle weakness, purple striae and things like that. Uh, but now that you say purple striae, uh, Atulya, uh, what are the skin changes which can be from which you can pick up a case of primary amenorrhea? Ma'am, in the skin we have to look for features of uh, hyper and hypothyroidism. That is, the skin can be cold and clammy or it can be dry. If it is cold and clammy, uh, what do you think it is? It is uh, seen in hypothyroidism. Yeah. So it is uh, the patient has got cold extremities and coarse features coarse and features. dry skin. It is hypothyroidism. hypothyroidism. Warm and moist, a moist skin is seen in warm and moist skin. You get in hyperthyroidism. hyperthyroidism. Uh, orange skin is uh, because of uh, eating disorders. Uh, patient uh, having more vegetables and fruits and hyperkeratinemia can cause orange skin. Purple like striae. we see in athletes, etc. We can see orange skin. Can purple uh, striae is uh, seen in Cushing's Cushing uh, syndrome. syndrome. Okay. Then acanthosis now you can see in, in PCOS, PCOS and hirsutism okay. features. And also uh, uh, pigment in nevi is seen in uh, Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome. So in the, from a certain uh, thing you can gauge even by looking at the skin you can. But the most important message I want all of you all to remember is that every primary amenorrhea you must investigate them thoroughly. Get a very good history from the patient. See whether it is primary or a secondary because we have not dealt with secondary amenorrhea here. We have talked only about primary amenorrhea. And in that investigations when you do, I told you about the uh, general examination of the patient. I said look at the general examination, look at the secondary mm -hmm. sexual characteristics and look at the stigma. So also I will tell you three things you should remember when you do the investigations. Three very important investigations. One is the karyotype. Next is the gonadotrophin level and third is imaging. So please remember that. So if I am to sum up uh, what you should be doing, investigate them properly, get a good history, okay, and the investigations. And in that investigations, three things you must do for everyone will be a karyotyping, an FSH LH to know at what level that is. And the third thing is an imaging, depending on what level you want imaging, whether just an ultrasound, whether you want an MR, whatever, whatever. Imaging at what level, level higher levels, lower levels, imaging. So, whatever, imaging is a very important thing. So, if you remember these things, you can actually tackle most of the conditions of primary amenorrhea. Come to a definitive diagnosis and write down the diagnosis and write down in that chart what all you have counseled the patient. That she will not have menstruation, she will not have childbirth, that she can... Uh, do the following like a donor oversight or a surrogacy or adoption, whatever. You must write down your advice because later on they will come and implicate that you did not tell them anything. So that's very important that you do everything and write down all what you investigate until you come to a definitive diagnosis. Okay. So friends, with these few words, we conclude this session. I thank my PGs for their wonderful contribution and thank you all.